Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is John Mark Walker, and I, uh, I run the open source program office at Capital One. And we have a really amazing story to tell um, about modernization of technology and specifically how we went about looking at open source and cloud and agile and DevOps and all the things that you know, everyone else associates with uh, modernization of technology. But in our case, we had a very uh, special, I guess, additional complication uh, in that, you know, we are in a highly regulated industry. And so the question is, you know, how did we as Capital One forge a path forward through all of these things while also maintaining, uh, you know, compliance with the regulatory requirements that we have? How did we address risk? How did we formulate a program that let us look at these things through the lens of risk management and how did we you know come together and do the things that we need to do um, it's a it's a great story it's a story about how we looked <clears throat> ahead to the future some years ago and we said you know what if we're going to meet um, the requirements of remaining competitive we're going to need to be open source we're going to need to be cloud first we're going to need to adopt new methodologies of collaboration to enable the and sustain the innovation that we need to move forward. And so all of these things coalesced and came about and we made some missteps along the way, um, but by and large, uh, by learning and taking feedback and figuring out the best way forward, we've created an environment that allows our engineers to participate in open source communities. And we're able to have what I consider to be a very forward looking uh, and forward thinking organization around technology. And the technology is important, don't get me wrong, but to me, the most interesting aspect of this is not the technology per se, it's the culture. It's, it's how we enabled collaboration. It's the, the processes that we adopted to be able to adapt to the needed change. Um, it's how we forged relationships with our partners uh, in risk and uh, different cybersecurity groups uh, to be able to enable what we needed to do. If you had the fortune of attending uh, a talk yesterday from Noreen D'Souza and Tyler Bell, they walked you through <clears throat> the partnerships that we need to build. And their, I think their talk was titled um, Partners in Open Source, the, the Friends You Didn't Know You Have. If you have a chance, you should definitely go back and look at that. What I'm gonna walk through today is uh, in some ways similar to that, but really focusing on what are the, what's the overarching uh, uh, narrative that, that we can talk about and how do, we, how do we look at risk in a way that allows us to progress? And frankly, you know, I think we need to talk about risk management and open source in a way that enables uh, companies like Capital One <clears throat> to be more collaborative. Because when you look at the entirety of risk, when you look at open source participation through a risk management lens, you come to the conclusion that open source participation is a means to mitigate and reduce risk. Um, and that's, that's exactly the, the path that, that I chose. And it's why uh, it's one of the primary reasons I came to Capital One. Um, I joined over a year ago and I've, I've been in open source communities my entire working life uh, for the most part. Um, and it intrigued me, uh, Capital One story intrigued me and it was um, enticing to me to, to be a part of that and to help push it along even further. Um, so as we, as we walk through you know, our journey and, and the lessons learned, um, understand that everything we're doing with respect to open source and cloud is about maximizing the innovation and productivity while reducing risk. And some of the things that we've done may not look like things that mitigate risk, but I will point out how they are because I want everyone to take away from this uh, key steps that you can take to, uh, to make sure that you know, your organizations uh, are well-managed around open source and cloud and that you have the tools that you need uh, to succeed. So without further ado, let me, um, let me go a step further and talk about how when you look at technology modernization and you look at the usage of open source software, um, there's a lot of, you have to take a holistic approach. You have to think about where does your software come from? Uh, who produced it? What is the state of its production? What's the state of the community? that produced it. And so you're seeing a heavy emphasis uh, from a lot of large enterprises on 
you know, scanning? How do we how do we make sure that we understand what's inside the software, what risks we're taking on, and all about how do you initiate or instantiate policies that help you govern the usage of open source, and how do you protect the supply chain, and how do you how do you construct a bill of materials so that you know you know everything that's running, and so. All these things come into play because you know most organizations by this point have come to understand the benefits of using open source. It's not, I don't think that's an argument for today. That argument was 15, 20 years ago. The argument now is how do you use it in a well-managed way? How do you get the most benefit from it? And how do you make sure that you know you're not introducing new risks? And how do you look at it through the lens of risk management? And to that point, you know, the, the previous slide was about a, a Gartner study, and this one references a Forrester uh, study. Uh, this one focuses on cloud container adoption in the enterprise, but really you could look at container adoption and use the same description that you see here around compliance and apply it to any kind of new disruptive technology that is at the beginning of its adoption curve um, or, or still rising in its adoption curve. Um, and you can see here, according to the Forrester report, Compliance is the number one concern among senior tech leaders using container management platforms. And this really comes down to, you know, how do you, um, how do you use these new technologies? How do you adopt them uh, through the lens of risk management and make sure that, you know, you're, um, you're on point uh, in your usage and your governance for these new technologies is sound. And that's what we're really going to walk through today is like, you know, adopting these new, te new technologies and processes while at the same time ensuring that we can sustain our innovation um, going forward. This gives you an idea of the impact of uh, open source on the enterprise. And this is a result of a uh, 2019 Lux Foundation survey. Um, I think there is actually a 2020 version of the survey which shows uh, comparable results. But the, the takeaway here is that Organizations that have made these cultural changes, organizations that have, you know, bought in to open source collaboration and use open source soft software um, extensively, um, these are the companies, these are the enterprises that that move fast. These are the ones that deploy software more frequently. These are the ones that have adopted DevOps principles more wholeheartedly. Um, it once you adopt an open source mindset it leads you down the path of other things, including cloud and DevOps and all the other things we associate with uh, software modernization. I think uh, open source goes hand in hand with all those things as they kind of coalesce together. And so, you know, you can use open source in the same way that you used uh, traditional off the shelf software. But the question is, why would you do that? Because with the, by embracing open source collaboration and by embracing open source platforms and libraries and tooling, um, it enables you a level of flexibility that you didn't have before. And so once you get used to that convenience, I think uh, Stephen O'Grady likes to refer to the convenience of open source and how that, um, that fall, flows into the convenience of you know, a cloud first mindset and the convenience of you know, having uh, a DevOps, uh, having adopted DevOps principles, it all sort of flows together. And you can see that um, encapsulated uh, in these diagrams and charts that sort of show you exactly, you know, what a difference adopting that mindset uh, makes. So let's, let's take a little path, let's take a little walk through the, the history of Capital One's modernization story, because uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a very compelling story. Um, when we started out, uh, you know, we were, you know, we had your traditional monolithic uh, set of monolithic apps. Um, and I have to give a lot of credit to uh, the leadership in our technology organization for recognizing that that approach was not going to sustain us going forward. And we had to make changes to adopt new practices, new tooling, uh, and we really had to enforce some type of cultural change to make it possible. And at the same time, recognizing that we had you know, regulatory requirements that maybe um, a lot of other companies don't have. And so it, it adds a complicating layer, but I think we've shown that it is possible um, once you walk through it and, and, and do what you need to do. But you can see the story that 
you know, you can see the open source focus um, early on where we basically declared uh, a few, some, some time ago, and we declared publicly, I think it was 2014, 2015, um, that we were going to be an open source first organization. That means that we were going to first and foremost focus on open source tooling and libraries that we can use uh, within our uh, developer uh, uh, process, developer uh, lifecycle. Um, and so by, by doing so, by starting on that path, I think we're now at the point where I think the last um, uh, survey I saw internally uh, was that uh, some a very large percentage of our internally developed applications uh, are composed of open source components. Um, I think it's upwards of 90% or so. And I think that's actually comparable to a lot of other enterprises. If you look at most of the survey data now, it's between 80 and 90% of uh, code that's deployed in internally has an open source origin. So we're, we're really just in keeping with that same overall trend. Um, but once we start down that path, and once we start realizing the, the flexibility and the convenience that, that comes from it, we realize that you know, we're going to start looking at you know, public cloud because again, continuing the story of convenience and flexibility, uh, public cloud offers things that you, know, you simply don't have when you uh, manage your own data center. And in fact, I'm happy to report that as of last month, um, we exited our last data center. We're now all in on public cloud. And that was enabled by our embrace of open source. Those things go right hand in hand. Um, I don't think you can adopt a cloud first mentality without first embracing uh, the open source software uh, as the uh, primary composition of your applications. And then as we move forward, we, we, um, we also did a few other things. We declared that you know, we're going to embrace DevOps principles. Um, we were going to, you know, Traditionally, or a few years ago, we had the same methodology as a lot of places where you know, we had our centralized ops and then we had the developers and the developers would finish developing and then hoof it over the wall and then give it to the, the ops people. But now, um, you know, we've, by embracing DevOps, DevOps principles, uh, I'm happy to report that we have embraced the concept of you build it, you own it. And so the developers develop, but they're also responsible for maintaining and monitoring and observability uh, going forward. And so that's, uh, that's led to um, some massive changes in how we develop and, and maintain software. Uh, we, we adopted Agile um, across most of the organization to the point where most development teams at Capital One now follow Agile methodologies. Uh, and then we, we also declared that, you know, we're going to move to a microservices model. And all these things were um, built out starting with pilot modes and then increasing the adoption across the organization. Um, and containers are following a, a similar path uh, uh, as well as you know, the microservices model as we've gradually but consistently moved away from the monolithic model and embracing uh, the microservices, the cloud first, the open source first, uh, agile, agile development, the DevOps principles. These, all, these things all go hand in hand as we fulfill sort of the ultimate you know, modernization of technology story. And it's, it's allowed us to sustain the innovation that we started, the path that we started on so many years ago. Uh, and we're able to you know, pivot quickly. You know, so as an example, when we all had to do our switch to work from home, um, that the quick pivot was enabled by the fact that we adopted all of these you know, highly flexible, uh, uh, maximizing convenience um, uh, processes uh, that allowed us to, to fulfill that obligation with very little disruption across the organization. And when you're able to embrace these things while making sure that you manage it well, um, you're able to, to do things like that. You're able to be as flexible as possible because you've embraced the overall convenience. And that's kind of the, the overall story here. How do you put that into motion? So let's talk about the, the open source focus because this is this is the, the first thing that we, we started talking about uh, all those years ago. Um, and it very quickly became apparent once we enabled our engineers to start making open source contributions. I think within a year of that, we recognized the need that uh, the need for having a or creating a programmatic approach to open source. And the first thing we focused on was usage. How do we govern the usage of open source across Capital One. And again, 
this is where the partnerships with our uh, with the risk and and uh, cybersecurity organizations came into play because when you start using open source the first question that's asked is around okay what are these licensing things what's the what is the GPL uh, what is what uh, what obligations do we now have once we adopt these open source licenses and so by pulling in our our legal partners and our risk partners we were able to create a system of governance around which we could enable our developers to use almost exclusively you know open source pieces and components to to build their applications but that there is an education that went along with that you know we we needed to educate our legal partners we need to educate our risk partners about why this is important um, and to their credit you know they were along for the ride and this is why i always emphasize whenever you're talking about you know building in organizational change you know developers are great you, you need your developers but in order to make this successful in order to unlock maybe some of the the roadblocks that you're going to find you got to work with your build relationships with your risk partners and legal partners in order to uh, and educate them so that you can actually push these things forward and that's one of the things i, I always emphasize when i give this talk is you know we couldn't have done this without developing the relationships uh, that we needed with the non-technical areas, the non-technology areas, so that we could uh, actually continue to move forward. And so by doing that, we're able to create this environment in which we can, you know, adopt open source first uh, and then use it uh, as the basis for, for um, SDLC. The next thing was contribution, you know, because when you look at open source usage, you very quickly come to a point where you're using a bunch of software and it gets old and stale and you have a bunch of um, changes that you want to make and where do you put those changes well the logical place is you push it upstream and i'll give a more comprehensive overview of what that looks like but for now i understand that this is sort of the the phase two you you use open source okay how do you enable your engineers to um to contribute to these open source communities because frankly you know, it's in your interest to do that. And that's the that's the argument that, you know, we make when we we have these partnerships with, um, with our legal and, and risk groups, uh, you know, contributing software back to the communities that you know, we're involved in or, or depend on um, is, is a key component of having an open source first mindset. So it's, it's all about taking those same partners and continuing the evolution as you as you build uh, this infrastructure um, that you need. And then, the, and then the, the next thing was, and you'll see examples of this later on in this talk, where we realized that, you know, we've got a lot of smart engineers and we've got, we've learned a lot of lessons from our um, progress in, you know, cloud first and open source first um, uh, modernization. How do we put this, how do we take these lessons learned and put them in a way that others can learn from them? And so I'm always a fan of, you know, show, don't tell. Um, although in this presentation, I am telling so, uh, but the show don't tell aspect of this is in launching new open source projects. And it was actually within, I think, a year or two of our open source first declaration that we started putting together the pieces that we needed to, to launch new open source projects. And I'm happy to report some new development in this area, but, uh, for now, just know that, uh, you know, that, that resulted in projects like Hygieia, which is a uh, DevOps uh, dashboard, uh, and uh, a Cloud Custodian, which allows you, allows you to institute um, uh, policies that, you know, and controls for your cloud assets. Uh, but we recognize that this was the next phase of the evolution, that in order to be, again, in order to have a comprehensive open source first organization, we needed an outlet for our engineers to put what they've learned into these open source projects that we can then develop collaboratively and learn even more from the process, um, as well as we, you know, as well as put the the software through, you know, run it through the gauntlet of other people's uh, enterprises, so that you know, it improves the the performance of the software. Um, and then we, you know, along the way, we have a couple of other pieces of the the story that help to fill in the the rest of it. Um, you know, when you're going to use open source, you're going to contribute open source, and you're going to launch new open source projects. Along the way, you're building in these collaborative processes. You're, you're recognizing um, the gains to be made by consolidating on certain platforms, uh, by developing you know consistent interfaces, by having you know breaking silos. You know one of the, one of the large DevOps principles is around 
um, the primary DevOps terms principles is around you know breaking down silos and by adopting these practices you're 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 incorporating what's known as inner source um, where all these communities you're enabling collaboration between teams between departments uh, which allows things to go faster and sustain the innovation that you need um, you know going forward and then the last piece of this is around you know the final piece of the the evolution the final piece of the puzzle is around how we relate to and work with um, these upstream communities that we depend on. Uh, again, the same thing as with contribution and sponsorship or launching new projects is how do we work with uh, these communities and foundations um, that, that we rely on um, that produce the software that we use in say 90% of our applications. And so there's a, I guess there's a, an obligation responsibility on our part to make sure uh, that these organizations are sustainable um, for the long term. Um, again, this is where we get into the reduction of risk or viewing things through a risk mitigation lens. By doing so, you emphasize the importance of working hand in hand with these outside groups. So this is uh, an overview of you know, what I would call a comprehensive uh, open source program office. And, and whenever I talk to the companies about what they're doing with open source, I always talk about you know looking at every angle of it and not just usage. Um, it's very easy to get locked into a point of view that the open source program is really about uh, managing license compatibility or compliance and security vulnerabilities. And that's true and those are very important, but you need to understand the provenance of, um, of those uh, of either security issues or license compliance issues and how do you actually work with the upstream communities to prevent them from happening in the first place which leads me to the the overall you know comprehensive view of our supply chain one of the one of the things i always recommend that companies look at when they're thinking of buttressing or coming out with a, a new open source program is to look at the totality of software they depend on and like many companies you know once we go through the exercise of looking at what are the foundational pieces of the software we're building? Again, we, we find that it's a very high percentage of code uh, that comes from you know beyond uh, our organization, you know, outside of these four walls. It it comes from these upstream communities. And the reason I like to look at the supply chain funnel as a model and a diagram to to think about these things is that it speaks to a couple of things. It speaks to the importance of the provenance of the uh, of the open source components that you use as the building blocks, but also shows you how you uh, uh, that flows into your overall product management. Uh, but the other thing it shows you is that implied in the supply chain funnel is that there needs to be a uh, a system uh, or at least a a, uh, uh, a process of that enforces bi directionality. It's not just that you're using these components of open source to, to build software. It's that because you're relying on them, there needs to be a bi-directionality between the, uh, the software components used to build and the, the developer platforms that they flow into. Um, without that bi-directionality, you're basically building in uh, excessive technical debt because you're, you're maintaining these things over time. By, enforcing a bi-directionality and by looking and by incorporating this model into your you know software development life cycle you know overview or the you know the seven stage or how many stages you have in your SDLC diagrams by overlaying these two things you're able to incorporate it into your overall development model and that way you can bake in the idea that hey we need to contribute these fixes back in order to get the sort of comprehensive uh, healthy supply chain that we need uh, to sustain what we're doing um, one of the one of the key pieces of this that I like to focus on are not not just the uh, components um, from the upstream uh, communities, but that middle layer, that developer platform. Uh, it has some unique characteristics that can make the difference between you know success or failure for your um, your open source projects. Because once once you get um, so once you incorporate all these different open source components into your respective build environments or application development, you end up with a, uh, about midway through, you end up with a, a set of a platform or, or set of tools that are mature enough uh, 
to attract developers. Um, you know, not quite a finished product, but but the thing that developers can rely on to, to build on. And that's why this becomes kind of a, a center of gravity for everything else that um, that you build. It's 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 not quite a finished product, but it's the thing that you can use to build community. You can build collaboration. Uh, and by by having these application developers work on you know the uh, the developer platforms, it can become a, a force multiplier uh, in your community building uh, efforts and your and your development efforts um, by by making these developer platforms accessible to more people, you're able to incorporate more feedback as you continue to develop uh, the platform before it's released. Uh, but you're also able to make sure that you have a relatively stable platform that developers can build their apps with reasonable assurance that it will continue to work even when it moves into the uh, the so-called the finished product stage. Uh, we all know that there is no such thing as a finished product, right? But um, but there are products that are ready for release, and so you need to both incorporate feedback from app developers as well as make sure that you have stable APIs that they can use um, that they can that are reliable and that continue to work as they go into the release product. Because again, this is where we enforce the bi-directionality. The finished product is not a finished product. Um, you're going to continue to relay feedback from that finished product into the developer platform. So again, at every stage of this, you've got the bi-directionality bi -directionality built in and you're able to have a well-maintained uh, supply chain uh, for your development efforts that you can sustain the effort um, over time. I, I came across this uh, idea uh, after talking with a friend from who works in the um, he works in the Intel uh, supply chain group, and uh, at the time I was an open source community manager, and he told me, "I figured out what it is that you do," and I said, "Great, why don't you tell me?" And he said, "You're the guy at the top of the funnel," and I said, "I don't know what that means. Explain it to me." And he went through how you know they when they when they piece when they source um, parts for different things they build at Intel, they talk about being at the at the top of the funnel or the beginning of the supply chain funnel and then tracking its progress as it makes its way through until they get to the end stage. And I thought that's a brilliant way of describing what I do because yes, I am the person uh, at the beginning of the funnel. That's the part that I like to talk about. But once I started thinking about it, I, I realized that when you're tracking progress in open source software, it's a, it's a different uh, metaphor than say, you know, what you'd use for a, a hardware product tracking purpose. Uh, because open source software, you're again, you're building in the feedback mechanisms, the, getting these feedback loops uh, uh, to maximum effect. And then that's when I came upon the idea that, you know, this middle tier is actually pretty interesting from a software development point of view. And you can look at so many uh, open source ecosystems that, that function this way from, you know, Kubernetes, where Kubernetes is that middle tier the upstream components that make up Kubernetes. And then at the end, you've got all these different distributions built on Kubernetes. Um, it can, you can use Linux where you've got um, different community distributions of Linux. Those are the, the places that attract developers. And then you've got end products based on those. So it, it, it helps to inform and it, and it applies equally well to products that you build internally, not just externally. Um, so if you're creating uh, software and you're releasing it for customers internally, I find this to be a useful way to, to look at your process and to look at your um, SDLC uh, governing principles uh, as a way to to maximize, you know, the, the open source collaborative aspects of it. So, And so as such, um, you know, I mentioned that, you know, when you look at the supply chain funnel and you and you look at that diagram to guide uh, you're thinking, you you immediately are struck by the importance of relying on uh, all these externally developed um, software components. Uh, and once you look at that and realize that you're dependent on, you know, ninety percent of your code coming from these places, you begin to uh, put into place uh, the processes that ensure that these com communities and foundations are sustainable over time. So as part of that. We have become, you know, members of a number of foundations and communities um, across the open source landscape. Um, the the CNCF is important to us because, well, one, we use a lot of the software that uh, is under the governance of the CNCF, uh, 
uh, but we also um, contributed a project to the CNCF, uh, it's called Custodian. Uh, I'll get into that in a minute. Um, you know, the To Do Group is a, is a great um, organization dedicated to, you know, governance of open source at internally at companies, if you, especially if you're part of an open source program office. And so it's important to us to know, you know what are the best processes that we can have in place. Um, the Apache Software Foundation, we, uh, we depend on a lot of uh, software that comes from there. So again, it's important to us that the uh, ASF is sustainable and that we are, you know, good members uh, 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 of its body. Um, the Linux Foundation um, has uh, so much influence uh, and it governs so many different projects that in order for us to be, uh, you know, good upstanding members of open source communities, it's important that the Linux Foundation is sustainable as well. And the same thing for the Python Software Foundation, uh, the, the, the FinTech Open Source Foundation, also called Finos. And then we have the, um, the Continuous Delivery Foundation because we are, we are an end user of continuous delivery tools. Um, we, we incorporate these tools throughout our SDLC process. Um, we, we rely on a lot of the tools that are under their governance. And so it, it just makes a lot of sense, you know, as an end user of these tools to make sure that we are good members um, of this organization. And I'm happy to report that uh, we, we've actually taken a lead role in helping to build out an end user community as part of the CDF, which uh, I hope to be able to talk to, to many of you about uh, later on. But, um, but in, in, uh, uh, in summary, the point of this is we are dependent on these things. In order to mitigate our risk um, from depending on these things, we have an interest in making sure that they're sustainable. And that's, this is us you know, fulfilling that interest and, and doing our part. So we went through the, the open source, you know, the open source first part. And in continuation of that, and really hand in hand with that, we have the, the part where we start to, to build out our cloud infrastructure, our tooling, our platforms. Um, and again, it goes hand in hand with open source. It's once you realize the flexible inconvenience of adopting open source principles, you go right into, hey, how can we maximize this and make better use of it? And I think Again, around 2015, uh, around, around that time frame, uh, we declared that we were going to we were going to go all in on public cloud, and it it caused uh, quite a stir at the time. Um, and uh, again, as I mentioned before, I'm I'm happy to report that we actually closed out um, our last data center as of last month, and uh, I think we made a big announcement around that. So it has come to fruition, and we've you know one thing I've learned being here is that. We talk about big things and big ideas, and then we actually make it happen. And that's a that's a pretty cool thing that um, I'm proud to be a part of, um, because once you once you realize this, you know, cloud first mentality, um, and then to adopt uh, simultaneously the DevOps principles and and incorporate that you build it, you own it mindset, um, you get this after effect of reducing duplicative efforts and making sure that. Uh, developers are more in point and that they're, while they're developing within the proper guardrails and processes that we've implemented, they're also breaking down silos and working more collaboratively uh, and consolidating their efforts around a few core platforms that help us to, uh, to move forward faster. And that's ultimately what it's, what it's about, allowing that, building that convenience into, you know, our systems and processes so that developers naturally migrate to it and they see the immediate benefit. That's probably the, the main thing. And, the, and again, all that was enabled because you know, we established these uh, partnerships uh, with our you know, risk groups and legal groups and cybersecurity groups and able to make this happen so it could become a reality. And along the way, we, we learned a lot of things from um, what we've done you know, in the open source arena um, through our efforts to incorporate, you know, DevOps principles and agile methodologies. Uh, we, we ended up taking what we learned and applying it in our uh, Hygieia project, which we launched uh, as our, you know, DevOps dashboard. So you could visualize the health of your, you know, CI CD pipeline. And we got some really good adoption from that. Um, in similar, uh, in similar ways, when we made our first forays into, you know, public cloud infrastructure, we realized that we needed to build out the configurations and processes to, to govern you know, the assets that we're putting in the cloud. 
And we took what we learned and we released the open source project Cloud Custodian. And Cloud Custodian uh, has had uh, an incredible adoption path. Um, frankly, it became too big for Capital One um, to the point now where you know, we've contributed to the CNCF, uh, where it is a sandbox project. And uh, we're, we're, we've just been um, really happy with the overall growth of the project and the, and the adoption uh, of the project because it, it helps other companies you know, learn from what we've, we've learned and to adopt the similar principles when they're, you know, um, when they're building out their, their cloud infrastructure. So it's a, it's a great, you know, advancement for different uh, open source communities that are looking to do similar things. But the, the overall takeaway here is that, you know, we take what we've learned and then we put it into open source projects. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a thing that we do here. And so as a continuation of that, when you look at what we've been able to do from a microservices and a container uh, management point of view, it's again, a similar story. We're, we're, we're putting together processes and technology platforms. We're putting them in place to enable uh, and sustain uh, innovation in this area going forward. And so that allows us to adopt some technologies that we've used to, to build out for this. Um, and we're, we're taking what we've learned and, uh, you know, uh, we've kind of made the first steps towards um, putting this out there. And you're going to see uh, some of that take the form of CRIP, which is our, uh, it's a command line tool for bootstrapping Kubernetes clusters. Um, so this is our sort of the first representation of you know things that we've open sourced ever as a result of you know, what we've been able to build out from a, a container infrastructure and management uh, standpoint, and uh, uh, you know can't I won't promise anything, but uh, you can see the uh, you know the, the the standard and the uh, that we've established over time. Um, so this is this is a good first effort for us and. Uh, very much looking forward to uh, your feedback on this. We were, I think we had a bit of a pause between uh, open source projects that we released, uh, but this was actually made public, uh, I think three weeks ago. Um, and we're looking forward to getting feedback on it and, you know, viewing this as a, a continuation of the story. You know, we went from open source to, to cloud to agile and DevOps. And along the way, building out these microservices platforms and adopting container management tooling and practices, and you're seeing that you know reflected uh, in this this project uh, that we just released. So I very much look forward to to hearing uh, you know how it, how it works for you and, and whether or not it, it works well for you. Um, but again, this is this is the the part of the the continuing story. Um, we set out to do very big things, and We've, we've been able to do them. We learned a few hard lessons along the way, but they're, they're useful lessons and they're things that, you know, I'm hoping that you can also um, take away and, and apply uh, to your organization. But the main things to emphasize here are, you know, the key part of being an open source first organization is you have to be active in the open source communities that you depend on. Again, 90% of your code comes from outside of the four walls of your organization. How do you maintain it going forward? Or, or I guess, how do you adopt a risk-based lens so that you understand that mitigating risk means working with these upstream communities so that you're not just dependent on what they produce, but you can actually actively engage in what they produce uh, and control your supply chain. Again, if you look at the supply chain model, you're dependent on all these things. So it's it's in your interest to make sure that they're the highest quality that they can be before they ever enter into your um, production process. Um, and so by being involved upstream, you're increasing the quality and you're basically reducing the level of effort required uh, to bring them up to speed once they do land you know, behind your firewall. Um, the other thing is, you know, this gets to the, the point around, you know, Fixing bugs and you know making sure that you know you don't you can to, uh, uh, to 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 harden the software, and your applications will be more secure when you can share it with experts. Um, it's certainly resulted in better software, uh, you know, in in the form of Hygieia and Cloud Custodian, and I'm hoping the same thing follows suit with Crit. Um, but once you share your code out there, once you put it out there, it does a couple things. I mean, first of all, you have to make sure that it's generally usable. You can't just create it. You just you can't just open source a, a bespoke solution that works specifically for an individual use case. 
you have to make it general purpose enough um, so that enough people can adopt it and use it for their own. And so it, it forces the developer to adopt this mindset of creating software for general usage, which when you think about it also results in overall quality an increase in quality for the software itself, even if it's just for internal usage, just because it's going to be more generally usable and can adapt to changing environments um, more readily. So it becomes more flexible overall. But beyond that, just having more people look at it, incorporating it, adopting it, maybe even contributing fixes, that's going to help increase the, the quality of the software as well. And so you get this community dynamic, you, you uh, maximize these feedback loops and have mechanisms for you know, other people, other developers and companies to influence the roadmap, it results in a better experience overall. And, and I, that's something that we've um, embraced and, and can tell a good story around. And then finally, you know, once you adopt this holistic model, once you, once you understand that your SDLC program extends far beyond your organization and that you need to look upstream and look at the source of where these things come from, it definitely influences your view of risk management and how um, incorporating that view help gives you the, um, uh, the uh, uh, it gives you the, the imperative to make sure that your supply chain can sustain what you need to do um, technology wise. And it's, that's probably the, the, the biggest thing that I like to emphasize when, when looking to adopt open source programs is, are you looking at your software development lifecycle holistically and comprehensively? Uh, and how does that influence your decisions to release software, contribute software, and um, make sure that the, the communities that you depend on are sustainable. So those are the those are the main takeaways. And I think with that, I think we have five minutes for questions. And I want to look at if you have questions. I guess um, feel free to ask them. I have five minutes. Ah, so I have a question. So this is accomplished over how many years? I think if you look at the first public declarations around being open source first, being cloud first, I'm going to say, and these are public declarations, declarations, so I'm not going to get in trouble for saying them, but I'm thinking it's in the 2014, 2015 timeframe when we, when we really went public with uh, what we were going to do here. So it's been a journey, um, but we, we had some immediate success with it. And that's the thing, like that immediate success fueled the continuation of it. So we, we once we went down that path, you know, we recognize that it's the right thing to do. And so that's, we've just, we've just followed through um, as we go on. Um, all right, uh, any, other, uh, any other questions before, before, we, uh, before we drop? Um, okay. Well, it, it's, I always love to, to tell the story. I always love to um, walk through it with, uh, with people and I cannot see the Q and A. Uh, can someone read me what it says in the Q and A so I understand what questions are being asked? Sure, um, here's a question from Gordon Huff that says, what are your main challenges today? The main challenges today are how do we, you know, when, when I was, um, when I joined Capital One, it was a, for a very specific reason. There were, there were two specific reasons. One is how does a company like Capital One uh, behave in such a forward thinking manner given where it is? And the second reason I joined was you know, over my years in different open source communities, I noticed that a lot of large enterprises weren't really present when it came to you know, the formation of you know, open source technology. You know, not participating in roadmap building, not taking on leadership positions in these communities. And so my coming here was really about learning why that is. And I think, you know, I've, I've discovered a lot since I've been here. So the, the, the main challenge is how do we take what we've learned and expand it? You know, we've, we have engineers making contributions. We've launched open source projects. Um, how do we make a larger splash? How do we scale up and scale out what we've been able to do um, to an even greater level? You know, how do we how do we take it to that next level? That's that's where my mind is right now. And that's kind of that's the reason I came here. And um, that's that's where I'm focused. I would I would say that's the the biggest challenge. You know, we've made OK, we've made some great progress. 
but how do we how do we even take it further than that? And that's that's the thing that um, that challenges and, and motivates me to uh, you know, to push this forward even further. All right, looks like uh, we're at time. Uh, thank you so much for um, coming here, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you and getting your feedback and uh, uh, working with you uh, down the line. Thank you. <laughs>